Hello and welcome to a deep dive discussion on ways that APIs can be hacked in order to protect them from hackers. We're now joined with cybersecurity expert, Dr. Katie Paxton Fear, as she shares her API hacking toolbox. She's using it to find the lurking API vulnerabilities that many organizations suffer from. Here's how Katie troubleshoots and stress tests APIs in order to help organizations better protect and design their APIs. I'm Dana Gardner, Director of Content at Traceable AI, your host for this series of API risk assessment and remediation discussions. Katie is currently a lecturer on cybersecurity at Manchester Metropolitan University in the UK and a researcher around the intersection of AI, ML, and InfoSec. She earned her PhD from Cranfield University and is an accomplished detective of security vulnerabilities for such large organizations as Verizon Media and the U.S. Department of Defense. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Katie Paxson Fear as she shares her API hacking toolbox and the ways that she uncovers the more subtle but potentially damaging API attack services across most organizations' API landscapes. Uh, introducing me. So today I'm going to be teaching you all about um, my like API hacking toolbox. So if you don't know me, um, I do a lot of offensive security on API. So I hack into APIs. Um, and to do that, as you can imagine, I have a big box of all the tools that I really like to use. So today I'm going to be telling you about those tools. And because of the challenges of the kind of areas I work in, I often don't have access to things like API endpoints. I don't know what the input and output is. I haven't seen necessarily any documentation, anything from Swagger. Quite often, I'm kind of going in blind. I always kind of think of myself as, um, you know, putting all the puzzle pieces together, except for there is nothing on the puzzles and I have no idea what it's supposed to look like. So I'm trying to connect them all together and create something, um, even though I don't know. And what that means is that I have to um, really have these lots of supportive tools that if I was kind of, you know, on the blue team, I might know what the API endpoints are. I might know what to include there. So let's chat about my kind of API hacking process first of all. So this is my process kind of very simplified. Um, first thing I can ask is what's in scope. Now scope is really important for me as an external tester because I don't want to break the law. And that might seem a bit facetious, but when you work in offensive security, keeping in your customer's scope in mind is really, really important. And it can be really tempting to be like, I'm going to find something no one else has found, so I have to go out of scope. Actually, you really don't have to go out of scope. And if you are going out of scope, you're putting a lot of risk on yourself. So I'm always asking myself what's in scope. If the API isn't in scope, I don't touch it. Now, quite often what you see in scope are things like mobile apps and mobile apps can connect to APIs in the back end. You can safely assume that API is in scope unless it explicitly mentions out of scope. And so when I do all my testing, I'm always thinking, you know, am I staying in scope? Is this in scope? Am I kind of doing right by my customer, essentially? So the next step is to enumerate an API. So I need to find out all the information that the blue team already knows. I need to find out every single API endpoint. I need to find out um, exactly what inputs they take. I then kind of come up with my plan of action. I'm looking at all of that, like what on earth is actually exposed here and thinking, okay, what kind of vulnerabilities uh, am I going to be experiencing? And quite often I kind of end up with either API specific vulnerabilities. So things like IDORs, BOLAs, um, a misuse of assets, or I have interaction vulnerabilities. So like I said, I test a lot of mobile apps and because I test a lot of mobile apps, often the mobile API doesn't expect you to say, for example, try a cross-site scripting attack because this is an app like it's connected to like you know the android components it's not going to be vulnerable to uh, cross-site scripting actually that's sometimes not the case depending on how it works 
And actually, you can use the mobile API to kind of bypass protections that might exist on like a desktop application. And from this, you can kind of see here that nothing can be 100% automated. And the tools that I'm going to be talking about support manual testing. They don't replace it. The same way that if you're on kind of a defensive team, um, you know that you can't use a single tool to solve all security issues. They're about supporting your existing processes and making things easier for you. If you use something like Traceable, you don't fire everyone on your security team and go, problem solved. You use that to support the people who are doing that manual testing, that manual security, and giving them a tool to help them kind of crunch the numbers, crunch all the data together. So it's really not about being like, press enter, press the tool, and bam, website hacked. So nothing can be 100% automated. Saying that, there are two clear stages that can be automated. So one is the enumeration aspect. This is time consuming. And the other is testing for some kind of vulnerabilities. So why is it kind of annoying to enumerate things? Now, RESTful APIs, I love them. I was, I develop RESTful APIs. I hack RESTful APIs. They are so annoying. They are some of the most annoying kinds of websites to test, like by a landslide. So because you have this really nice developer-friendly, predictable structure, um, going through, you know, your create, your read, your update, delete. That takes a lot of time to go through because for every resource that you might have, so if you're looking at like a social media website, like say Twitter, you've got tweets, you've got replies, you've got accounts, you've got, you know, potentially being able to log into more than one username, you have direct messages, you have people you follow, you have people following you. And at the point, that's seven API endpoints but then you have, for each of those, four different CRUDs. So you have seven times four, and actually that's kind of a smaller API. A proper API that goes in something like a mobile app can have literally like 50 API endpoints. And you have to, it takes patience to go through every single one of these. And primarily my automation is about that, making that process less annoying to test. I do, in terms of like confirming vulnerabilities, I do a lot of that manually, but getting through that CRUD, uh, all those endpoints, that is primarily what I'm trying to automate because it's not fun. It, it's the boring part of API hacking. So the kind of way a blue team thinks about like their attack surface and doing things like an inventory, I'm thinking about their attack surface. So starting with what's in scope. So because I do a lot of bug bounties, I actually often will get a burp configuration file that I can import into burp and it will only show me in scope items. So automatically, I just don't see anything in scope. And this is a really great kind of, not necessarily automation, but little trick that makes sure that I'm not thinking constantly is that API endpoint in scope. I'm still checking manually, like I'm still going through there and making sure that it's in scope, but I don't want that to be a constant thought. One thing to note is that if you do work with like a bug bounty platform or even with a customer directly, if you go out of scope, one, your client is not going to be happy with you if you're working in something like a pen test environment. But if you're working in a bug bounty environment and you go out of scope, the program might say, hey, you know, that's not cool. We're going to apply something like a ban. And that can impact your standing with a platform. And in a bug bounty context, that's bad because you're losing access to those, um, like, uh, those kind of customers that you can interact with. So what's in scope is kind of something that has that, like, manual and um, kind of automated testing. It's just to avoid that, like, extra thinking you have to do. So reconnaissance. So some of my favorite tools for doing kind of traditional reconnaissance. Um, a mass. So a mass is a free tool. Um, it's part of the OWAS suite of tools. And if you haven't had a look at what OWAS provide, they actually do a ton of stuff for free. Um, does a lot for a reconnaissance tasks, especially finding subdomains. So often APIs are hosted at, you know, domain.com forward slash API forward slash version one. 
Sometimes you can actually find them on a subdomain like API or tools. More common on mobile apps, actually, where they don't want to, or they kind of want to add that uh, security by obscurity la layer. But a mass is, in my opinion, one of the best tools for subdomain finding. It includes a lot of different approaches for finding them. One cool thing that you can do, especially with Android apps and finding API endpoints, you can actually go through the APK to kind of find um, the API endpoints. I find it's much easier to just have the app proxy through something like Burp. Some other really cool tools, Lazy Recon, um, which is this great, like you just do Lazy Recon, the domain name, and it kind of runs a bunch of different tools. Web screenshot takes screenshots of URLs. So if you have like an API, what you might see commonly is at the root of the API. So your domain.com forward slash API forward slash version one, then it might say, you know, this API is powered by whatever. So um, for example, it will show you Lumen and then the version for Lumen uh, if you're running kind of the Lumen microservice. And also there's a BBHT, which includes a bunch of different tools that all work together. Um, I don't really use a lot of this kind of reconnaissance. I am quite often dealing directly with APIs. I've already gone through that step to uh, kind of access the uh, Android file, access the iPhone app, and then find what it's actually referring to. So API enumeration, far more useful. Um, my number one recommendation for API enumeration, if you're on the red team and if you've done kind of black box testing, Kite Runner. By far the best tool um, for RESTful APIs. I always find it captures more than traditional word lists. I find that it does a really good job um, with finding more unique endpoints and it's not testing for kind of old style SOAP APIs. Quite often it is testing just for RESTful. Uh, FFUF, if you do have a traditional word list, so there are, I'm gonna talk about them in a moment, but there are some different um, API word lists that you can find. I don't find they work the best, but FFUF is definitely the fastest tool. And Axiom is a tool which allows you to take your FFUF uh, and run it in the cloud by scaling up to starting like a bunch of um, droplets and doing it all based in the server. On the topic of word lists, I really like Tom Nom Nom's word list method. So Tom Nom Nom has done this talk, it's called Who, What, When Word List. And he has a bunch of kind of methods for creating uh, target specific word lists. And I really like this. I think this is a really great idea, especially for APIs, because often with RESTful, we're dealing with human words and that can make it quite challenging, especially if you compare it to like traditional websites where you might have like a slug of a URL with this kind of approach of having like um, uh, looking through the code and finding, you know, do they call their users, users or customers, because that API endpoint could be different. Now, the other thing I really like is generic nouns, verbs, and actions rather than things labeled API word lists. And that's because things labeled API word lists tend to be so specific to the context they're running in. And quite a lot of them are based on SOAP APIs, not RESTful APIs. And they are very different kinds of APIs and they work in very different ways. So I really like to have kind of like common nouns, common verbs, um, rather than like API word list big or, or whatever. So burp automation. Now I mainly use burp. You don't have to use burp. There's plenty of other options that aren't burp um, and plenty more that are coming out. Big one is OWASP zap, uh, but certainly that's not the only ones. Now, when I test APIs, or when anyone tests APIs, you're gonna have associated IDs. So post one might have an author ID, users might have role IDs, and I like to set up this uh, little regex pattern. And what it does is it automatically detects where it has an underscore ID and then searches for that API endpoint um, 
adding like an S if you have to. It depends on the API whether or not it has plural words or singular. Now, with that in mind, if you have an author ID, you have likely a relationship. So you likely have like a one to many relationship there, a many to one relationship or whatever. And by doing detecting that automatically and then trying for those API endpoints, you can kind of take away quite a lot of that automation um, with running additional tools. Great for your customer because when you do black box testing like this, you create a lot of noise on the defensive side. And if they are using um, tools that detect uh, intrusions, they might detect your traffic. And if you're sending thousands of requests because you've got a really long word list, that can be really disruptive because how, if you're doing your testing, how can your client see like an actual intrusion that happens to take place at the same time? So by approaching it this way and doing this kind of clever automation, we reduce the traffic for our client which reduces um, or enables them to really detect intrusions even when we're testing. And another great thing is GraphQL uh, APIs. So GraphQL has really easy um, enumeration. You have a GraphQL introspection query. Payload All Things has one of those if you've not seen an introspection query, but essentially an introspection query will look through the, um, the meta tags in the database or the GraphQL API, and it will then return the meta. So it'll tell you, hey, here are all the queries, here are all the mutations that you can run, and here's uh, what it expects to get. Now, there's a tool called NQL for Burp, which automatically sends that for you and creates this kind of nice folder structure for uh, GraphQL endpoints. And one thing I really like is that it uses time and date. Now, as you probably know, if you're already doing like API security, APIs can change all the time. New, a new endpoints get released, new resources might get released, things will change. And because you see that change, if you can notice when something changes, you can find something no one else finds. If you can kind of match the DevOps, um, like uh, tempo with your security testing, you can actually pick things up really quickly. And because it has this, uh, folder structure that takes into account time as well and date, you can see how the API changes over time, which is really neat. So what about finding vulnerabilities? Now, my number one piece of advice is don't use automated scanners if you're kind of doing this for bug bounty or for necessarily even for pen testing. There's just no point. You're going to get false positives. You're going to get duplicates. These tools are not designed for APIs in mind. Like they are very much designed for more traditional um, websites. They don't expect the same input. They don't expect the same output. The best one is Nucleary if you want to use one. But for APIs, I really don't recommend it. There are some API specific vulnerability scanners, which I think are better. But again, they tend to rely on things like having a swagger file with all the API endpoints, which we usually don't have or they expect you to be able to uh, list all the API endpoints and you just don't necessarily have that. So vulnerability scanners are not the best. However, just because the vulnerability scanners aren't the best doesn't mean you can't implement some kind of automation, which may not give you the full kind of uh, options a vulnerability scanner will, but still gives you a lot of information. So let's talk about IDORs. Um, so when I use IDOR in this context, I'm referring to the old name for BOLA, um, broken object level authorization, but also broken function level author uh, broken function level authorization, where each of those refers to one being able to access a resource that your user doesn't have permission to see, i.e., it's a resource that belongs to another user, and you can't edit that. And the other one, it refers to having an admin function available for lower level users. So I'm going to use the term IDOR to return to both of them. Now, the best tool for hunting for IDORs is a tool called Autorize. It's really horrible <laughs> UI design. It's very hard to, to use, but it's by far the best tool. So if you give it a cookie, that's your attacker. It will go through as you kind of explore an API. 
um, it will automatically tell you if the authorization is being enforced. You can't necessarily test multiple permissions levels. So if you are looking for broken function level authorization, having like a guest, a user, a moderator, a super moderator, admin, you can't do that. You've got two accounts. That's all you can do. But you can do cross organization as well and cross user. So if you've got um, a application that's broken into organizations and users belong to org or organizations, you can test if a user from another organization can access um, another organization's resources. You can also test cross user. It's really, really great. And it has this nice like bypass is enforced question mark. The actual UI for using it is horrible, but it's a good tool. Lack of rate limiting. So FFUF is by far the best for speed. Um, saying that I don't tend to test lack of rate limiting very often. Um, just because rate limiting, one, is not very interesting vulnerability to test for, and two, the impact is usually quite limited to accounts and in a kind of bug bounty context, accounts are some of the first things that people test. So often you're kind of testing what other people have already done. Burp Intruder has a really good, um, like very friendly interface for the pro version, has the best usability. Um, but you have to pay for it. Now there's another like tool or like group of tools called IP Rotate, which will connect you up to like a bunch of different um, VPNs and will check for chest for lack of rate limiting there. Don't use it. When I actually worked at Bug Bounty Platform, I like this was one of the most common vulnerabilities that gets like NA because that doesn't mean lack of rate limiting because the rate limiting is being enforced, you're just bypassing it. And actually, how are you supposed to, as a company, stop what could be multiple users accessing the website? Like, it's just not a very good tool. It can produce a lot of false positives, not part of my my uh, my toolbox at all. Information disclosure. So there are really great regex patterns to match different data types. So common ones for me based in the UK, emails, postcodes, um, in the UK, we have GDPR, which means personal data is really restricted here. So it's really great to approach these from a, a perspective of, um, oh, what are the GDPR likely ones, right? Um, Regex Lib has this, like, you can just search it and it will come up with a bunch of these different regexes. You don't even need to write them yourself. Logger Plus Plus is a burp add-on where you can put in the regex. And it will search through all the API response to tell you which one, like whether or not it's got a match. Um, so here you can see I've looked at email addresses and actually it was leaking email addresses, which means that, you know, there's a bunch of Gmail addresses um, that would be considered against GDPR because those are considered personal data. Now, some more specific tools, um, SQL map for doing SQL injections, not very common. On modern APIs, um, we tend to see them behind kind of things like Lumen, like frameworks where actually they are doing proper mitigation for SQL injection. No SQL map. So no SQL map works for no SQL databases. It's a bit rare. I don't see them very often. I tend to see SQL um, behind something like uh, Lumen or Laravel or another framework. Now there is a CSRF uh, proof of concept generator in Burp that's really helpful when testing APIs, especially if they tend to enforce it. Some APIs don't enforce CSRF, but some do. But my favorite tool out of all of these is JWT tool, which is really great for working with JSON web tokens. And if you're not sure what they are, they're just a way of encoding data and they start with um, EYJ and that's how you can notice them. So they always start like that. And if you see one, um, you can put it into this tool and it can do a lot of like tampering with them, um, of testing for known issues with the JSON web token. Really, really helpful. So thank you very much for listening. That's my API hacking toolbox. Um, as you can see, I use a lot of different tools 
that all kind of work together but actually most of them just support what I do anyway as part of my manual testing it just makes my life easier and that's kind of the theme I think of what you do when you're doing black box testing it's not how do you automate this and solve it it's how do you make your life easier so thank you very much um and i'm ready for any questions you may have about my toolbox katie those are some very impressive ways to uncover the many ways that too many organizations too often face when it comes to api risk so please join me in thanking dr katie paxton fear for her valuable insights and deep expertise. We've learned the innovative ways that Katie troubleshoots and stress tests APIs using her unique toolbox in order to help organizations better protect and to design their APIs. To learn more about API security best practices from Katie, follow her on Twitter at InsiderPhD. And to learn more about API discovery, cataloging, and observability for detecting risks early and completely, please look to Traceable AI as a great resource for information and solutions. Visit us at Traceable AI and on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thanks for joining and look for more discussions from Katie and other cybersecurity experts from Traceable AI on our API vulnerability and remediation discussions series. Thank you.